Hey everybody, today we're debating creation evolution and we're starting right now. Hello everybody, I am your gentle and modern moderator here today uh, and I'm just here to help James out and keep these two hooligans out of trouble as we have a fun and civil discussion on uh, creation evolution. It's going to be a really great time. Uh, if you've seen me around, you probably know what I'm about. I'm here to be as unbiased as possible and just let these two uh, hash it out and go back and forth. We're going to have a really good time. Um, and I know these guys, so I know that I'm probably not going to have to do a whole lot of moderating, which is uh, great on my end because I get to sit back and... Uh, soak up the discussion. Before we introduce uh, everybody, uh, channels are all in the description. So if you like uh, what you hear today, you're thinking, what's that thing James does? If you like it, you're like, mm, I want some more of that. Uh, check out the links in the descriptions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and let these guys introduce themselves and we can go through the format and jump right in. What do you guys think? Sounds good to me. Let's do it. <clears throat> all right. Whichever one of you would like to introduce yourself first, please, by all means. Well, I guess I'll go uh, first because I can be nice and quick here. No stranger to this channel. Been here many times. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to anybody who helped arrange this debate. I've got a lot of respect for Dr. Garrett here, so I'm really excited for this uh, this debate. And Erica, she's uh, she's moderated on my channel numerous times, so she's, she's one of the best. So it's an honor. And we've got uh, Brother Praise behind the scenes. So I'm excited for this one. If if you like what you if if you like debates discussions, you can always check out my channel as well because I do my best to host um, some pretty good debates and discussions. I've had Ron on many times. So even if you may not agree with what I'm saying, but you like debates, go check out my channel. So thanks so much. Absolutely, hit us up, Ron. Hey, I'm Ron Garrett, uh, first timer here on MDD. Really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I am a semi-retired computer scientist. Um, slash software engineer. And uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing. You said we're debating creation evolution, but the actual topic for today was uh, supposed to be, is biblical creation science-based, which is not yes. quite the same thing. I think that's a fair correction to me. And don't worry, Ron, that's what I've prepped for too. So no awesome. worries. Awesome. My mistake, guys. Sorry. Well, I, I'm, sorry. Sure. Oh, I'm so new at all this moderating. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're so used to it being creation versus evolution anyways, and that seems to what bring you know brings the people in. So oh, yeah. <laughs> no. okay. but you know what? You guys are the debaters, so you know, as long as the two of you as long as the two of you were on the same page, I guess me goofing up uh it can be rectified once you once y'all take over. Well, <laughs> shall we go through, we go through the format? Let's let's run through it. We're doing uh 12 minute openers with general open discussion. Um, to, to kind of give things a general structure, we were thinking, you know, I was talking with, with the guys here, and we were thinking uh, kind of three minutes back and forth. Um, and that three minutes is generally just to keep things um, moving, you know, so that so that one person doesn't feel like they're monologuing or another person feeling like they're not getting quite as much time. Um, so we'll do that open discussion for around an hour, uh, five minute closers, followed by a Q&A. So, you know, please shoot me questions or actually, I guess you're tagging modern day debate, which would be uh, praise. Um, and we'll, we'll respond to as many of them as we can. Super chats, you know, as is the law of the Internet ether, you get to go first. Um, but that's just showbiz, baby. We're excited to we're excited to get the questions and see see what the debaters have to say. Um, and I've kind of blathered on long enough, so I, I believe Standing is going first. Yes. Yes, that's that sounds good to me. I guess I'm the affirmative tonight. Uh, like I said, looking forward to this debate. As praise gets this going, uh, before I start my timer, um, like I said earlier. Thanks to everybody involved in, in arranging this debate. I appreciate Dr. Garrett's willingness to debate these very important topics. Uh, thank you, Dr. Garrett, for doing this debate. We are here tonight, though, to discuss scientific evidence for biblical creation. In this 10-minute opening, I'm going to cover a large number of lines of evidence that demonstrates biblical creation, but more specifically, a biblical model of human origins. These same lines of evidence also refute the evolutionary story of human origins. Let us get 
right into it. Praise looks good on the screen. Okay. See what you got. Beautiful. So we can test the biblical claims of human origins to modern scientific data. In Genesis, we read that God created two people, Adam and Eve. This claim has especially important genetic implications. Does the empirical scientific data support the biblical account of human, human origins? Let us look and see. If we have all descended from just two people thousands of years ago, we would expect low genetic diversity in human beings today. If deep time evolution were true, and we've been accruing genetic mistakes for millions of years, we would, we would expect high levels of genetic diversity, of course. The data confirmed the biblical creation expectations. How does Dr. Garrett here explain the low genetic diversity in human beings? Genesis tells us God created two humans, Adam and Eve. This would severely restrict genetic diversity. And this happens to be exactly what we find. Evolutionists were shocked by this, which is why they had to post hoc ad hoc invent their fairy tale out of Africa population bottleneck. The, the hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck would have involved very serious inbreeding and genetic damage. I'm just hearing a little bit of background noise, I think, praise, maybe from Ron's section, which is fine. If, if praise, if you could just mute Ron real quick. Um, okay, let's see. So I've got a lot of, a ton of scientific papers here actually today to discuss with Dr. Garrett. I know he likes the scientific papers and I've brought forth plenty for us to discuss. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, right here, you can see harmful protein coding mutations and people arose largely in the past 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. Uh, lots of good stuff here. Let's move on. So we've also got strong evidence for one Y chromosome ancestor and one mitochondrial DNA ancestor. For example, males all have a piece of DNA that we only get from our fathers. This is called our Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is passed on unbroken from father to son. From time to time, a mistake happens. And every time this happens, a new branch in the family tree is produced. If we simply look at all the branches in the world today, they go back to a single person. This single person is not a chimpanzee, it's a man. This is a man who lived just a few thousand years ago. This would actually be Y chromosome Noah. A recent paper you can see here by Dr. Nathaniel Jensen confirms that we only observe 4,500 years worth of mutation accumulation. Testable predictions have been confirmed by creationists on the Y chromosome, as you can see here in this paper. To this day, there has been no satisfactory challenge to this incredibly fascinating data. Why is the data so consistent with the claims of Genesis? Every single whale, uh, male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical. There is extraordinarily little variation in the Y chromosome. This is a strong indication that we share a very recent Y chromosomal ancestor. It turns out that when the chimpanzee Y chromosome, you can see the paper here, when it was sequenced, it was discovered to be less than 70% like the human Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is uniparentally inherited DNA or non-recombining DNA, just like the mitochondrial DNA. The Y chromosome should have been vastly more similar between humans and chimpanzees. Uh, here's some more information on the Y chromosome, which we can touch on in the discussion if uh, Dr. Garrett would like to. Um, going back to molecular clocks, molecular clock studies confirm Adam and Eve and biblical creation. Here's a paper. We know uh, Eve's mitochondrial sequence. And if uh, Dr. Garrett would like to know how we do so, I'd be happy to explain in the uh, discussion portion. So evolutionists, though, they look to time dependency to explain away the data. If Ron here would disagree with the Eve date derived from straightforward mitochondrial DNA coalescence equations, he would, he would need to make testable predictions, of course. That's the gold standard of science. When does the molecular clock speed up and slow down, for example? Many other critics have looked to substitution rates to solve the problem that arises from pedigree-based mutation rate studies. Regardless of the rescue device employed, without testable predictions, of course, the rescue device is pseudoscience. All critics have failed to make accurate testable predictions on mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome. Can my opponent, Ron, here today finally answer this problem? We shall see. You can see here that um, the evolutionists, they um, base their dates on molecular clocks uh, on a lot of assumptions. Um, for example, the evolutionary dates are clearly dependent on many tenuous assumptions. Uh, the FBI has even adopted the faster mutation rate that all confirms a biblical creation model of human origins. When does the molecular clock speed up and slow down? There's even been a, a recent study involving barcodes across 100,000 species. 
that this is from a, a secular paper as well that concluded that over 90 percent of species on the planet today originated at the same time it says and yet another unexpected finding from the study species have very clear genetic boundaries and there's nothing much in between just as we would expect based on the biblical creation model. And based on the created heterozygosity hypothesis, we would predict that the vast majority of DNA differences and DNA elements are functional. DNA function related predictions are being confirmed more and more every day. These are predictions that flow directly from a biblical creation starting point, And that's what the topic of the debate is. We have preliminary evidence for genome wide functionality. ENCODE has revealed that over 80% of our genome is active in some way. This all suggests function. Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, a geneticist, explains it perfectly. He states, during the course of explaining these concepts, the publicly funded ENCODE project, which stands for uh, Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, is mentioned. ENCODE was a critical public research effort that discovered how much of the genome, even the parts that do not directly code for a protein, is regulatory in some way. In fact, the regulation of gene expression by the wide variety of RNAs produced from non-protein coding DNA sequence are now being perceived as more important targets of study than the actual protein coding sections of the genome itself. The wide diversity of non-coding RNAs in a cell affects virtually all aspects of growth, development, and physiology. The protein coding sections of the human genome comprising just less than 3% of the whole are somewhat analogous to the raw materials, for example, bricks, boards, wire, et cetera, one would use in a building construction project. It is the intelligent oversight implementation and usage of these raw materials that makes the building take shape and function. And that seems to be what non-coding RNAs are used for. The evidence for genome-wide functionality is overwhelming. As you can see here from these numerous papers and articles, we know that ERVs and other classes of retrotransposons accomplish many crucial functions in regulating gene expression. They help determine cell types, they help with development, and even assist in cell stress responses. Here's a, um, uh, an article here that states, far from being junk DNA, and this is not from a creationist source, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome have a powerful capacity to influence genes and chromatin, just as we would expect from a biblical creation starting point. Another fascinating paper here too is somatic retrotransposition alters the genetic landscape of the human brain. ALUs, for example, presumed by the evolutionists to be nothing more than uh, parasites and junk DNA, intronic ALUs influence alternative splicing, regulatory activities of transposable elements from conflicts to benefits, paper after paper. We could talk about this forever. Uh, let's see. Let's move to orphan genes. What about the functional orphan genes that show independent ancestries? How does Ron here today explain this incredible class of taxonomically restricted and essential genes? These orphan genes defy universal ancestry. Ancestry. These genes are unique sets of coding sequences that are specific to particular organisms and they show no consistent hierarchy. Um, as you can see here in the slide, orphan genes are sequences of DNA that code for proteins, but they have no apparent relatives. Exactly what we would expect given the model of, of biblical kinds. Uh, protein moonlighting, another fascinating paper, old proteins learning new tricks. Protein moonlighting is akin to having a multifunctional tool. Another fascinating paper here, redundancy of the genetic code enables translational pausing. Um, in, in More Than a Monkey, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins' book, he concludes, before I get a little more in depth into this paper, he concludes that many similar genes between humans and chimps are expressed very differently. Evolutionists often look to the, the homology when it's, in fact, the expression levels are completely different between uh, chimps and humans. The expression profiles bear no signs of selection or having evolved. Genes associated with brain, cell transport, cell signaling, testes, and many meta metabolic functions show distinct, distinctly different expression levels between humans and chimps. These genes occur in elaborate networks and not only must be precisely coordinated within these networks, but also between organs all over the body. In addition, many expressed genes in humans are not even found in CHIP. Research has clearly shown a pattern of incredible irreducible complexity in the genome that appears suddenly and fully integrated in humans, totally distinct from chimpanzees. Exactly, once again, of what we would expect from a biblical creation starting point. Another prime example would be this paper here as to why the nested hierarchical patterns in the biological world that we see are there by design and not by descent. It's covered in this article on evolution news and views. 
Well, think again, it says, the theory of intelligent design predicts that living organisms will be rich in information. And thus it encourages us to seek out new sources of functionally important information in the genome. This new paper fulfills an ID prediction by finding that synonymous codons can lead to different rates of translation that can ultimately impact protein folding and function. This is fascinating stuff. This means, it continues, that DNA contains multiple languages or encoded commands occupying the same string of contiguous base bases. On the one hand, a string of nucleotide bases encodes amino acids. On the other hand, that same string contains information about the rate at which the ribosome should translate the protein so that it can properly fold into the right shape. The paper calls this translational pausing, as you can see here on the screen. The ribosome is capable of reading both sets of commands, as they put it directly in the paper. One minute left, standing. Thank you so much. No the problem. ribosome can be thought of as an a functional processor of data that it sees at its input. To put it another way, the genetic code is multidimensional, a code within a code. This multidimensional nature exceeds the complexity of computer codes generated by humans, which lack the kind of redundancy of the genetic code. It comes down to the question that I can ask Ron, how does Ron explain that which requires forward thinking? Uh, just under a minute here, so here's some more papers we can look at. Epigenetics requires forward thinking. Uh, the entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. The chromosome 2 fusion, as you can see here, has been overturned. We know that the fusion site is a functional element inside an RNA helicase long non-coding RNA gene. Um, we can discuss that in the... 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Um, yeah, you know what? I'll save anything else for the discussion. Really looking forward to it. Lots of technical papers here for Ron and I to discuss. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you so much for listening. Oh, right. Thanks so much. That was great. Um, we're going to kick it over to Ron. Uh, that was about 12 minutes again. So by all means, Ron, um, take your time and I'll let you know what one minute and I'll let you know again at 10 seconds. Uh, wow, that is so not what I was expecting for the topic. Um, the topic was supposed to be, uh, is biblical creation science-based? But uh, that felt to me a lot more like a gish gallop of support for the argument that uh, evolution is utterly uh, scientifically untenable uh, and, and that there's an overwhelming weight of evidence against it. Um, I can't possibly do justice to that in detail. All I can do is point out two things. One, that I know SFT knows this because he's heard me say it many times, I'm not a biologist. And so I can't really speak to the details of the biology. And the second thing is that if his claims were true, then there are only two possible outcomes for this. Either the biologist, the biological scientific community, the people who do understand this stuff would either accept it or they would either reject it on the merits or you'd have to have some explanation for why they were rejecting it despite the fact that it was true. So I had this whole section written up about how to define science because I thought that's what we were uh, gonna be talking about. Um, you know, the question of whether biblical creation is based on science turns on the question of what science actually means. And all of the things that you were saying sounded kind of sciencey, but I think miss the essence of what science actually is. Um, and I thought we were gonna agree to, uh, I had this, all these different definitions, but during the pregame huddle, we agreed that we were gonna adopt Karl Popper's definition, which is that science is the process of finding good explanations for what we observe. Um, and one of the things that we observe is that the scientific establishment uh, doesn't accept your arguments. And so that is a fact that requires explaining. Um, this definition seems like it begs the question a bit because it doesn't tell you what a good explanation is, but it turns out that you don't actually need to define it. It turns out that nature is structured in such a way that the criteria for what makes a good explanation actually emerges from the process of searching for good explanations. And let me illustrate uh, this with an example. There is this thing called last Thursdayism, which is the hypothesis that the universe was created last Thursday. It was created in the exact state that it was in last Thursday with all of us, including our memories of times before last Thursday intact. But those memories are illusions because the universe didn't actually exist before last Thursday. Now, I hope we can agree that this is not a good explanation of what we observe, but why? It's entirely consistent with all of our observations. You can't rule it out on the evidence. 
and it seems a little lame to try to rule it out on the grounds that it just seems ridiculous because what seems ridiculous to me might not seem ridiculous to you. So is there some principled way that we can rule out last Thursdayism? And it turns out that yes, there is. We can observe that this theory contains this arbitrary value of last Thursday. Why last Thursday? Why not Wednesday? Why not a year ago or five minutes ago? Last Thursdayism is just one member of a vast family of hypotheses, one for every instant in time in the past. And here's the thing, at most one of them could possibly be true, but we have no basis for choosing between them because all of them are by construction consistent with all of the evidence. Because of that, we're justified in rejecting them all because even if one of them happened to be correct, there's no way we could ever know. So last Thursdayism is not falsifiable. So we don't have to build falsifiability into our definition. It turns out that it's a logical requirement if we're going to eliminate obviously bad explanations like last Thursdayism. And there's a second criterion of good explanations, which is that they have to be confirmed by experiment and consistent with all of the evidence, which is to say they have to be falsifiable, but they have to resist our best efforts to actually falsify them. And it turns out that if you adhere to this discipline of only considering falsifiable theories and rejecting the ones that are actually falsified by experiment, what's left at the end of this process gives us tremendous power to predict the future and thereby to exert control over our destiny. And this is the reason that people care about science in the first place. When you do it right, it gives you the gift of prophecy. Interestingly, the idea of letting experiment be the arbiter of truth actually turns out to be biblical. Deuteronomy 18.22 says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if a thing follow not nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. I think that's my favorite verse in the entire Bible because it's actually a full-throated endorsement of the scientific method. If you want your hypothesis to be accepted, you have to show that it makes accurate predictions, that it gives you the gift of prophecy. And on that criterion, all of your citations in your opening notwithstanding, biblical creation utterly fails this test. As far as I know, biblical creation has never made a prediction that is both different from a prediction made by mainstream science and that turned out to be correct. And there's a reason for this. Improving on the predictions made by mainstream science is really, really hard. Humans have been doing the science thing for about 400 years now, and we've gotten pretty good at it as demonstrated in no small measure by the technology that we're using to have this debate. Computers and the internet didn't happen because someone studied the Bible. They happened because over the course of 400 years, a lot of people did a lot of painstaking research to filter out the, uh, sorry, I lost my place here, uh, to, to filter out the best explanations with the most predictive power out of all the possibilities that anyone could think of. Improving on that process is really, really hard, which is why the people who succeed win Nobel prizes. <laughs> But the situation with biblical creation is even worse than that because biblical creation starts with the assumption that the Bible is divinely revealed truth and completely without error. I've never met a creationist who was even willing to consider the possibility that they might be wrong about that. Maybe you'll be the first. That alone reveals biblical creationism to be unscientific. In science, all knowledge is tentative, subject to being overturned at any time by new evidence or better ideas. If you're not open to the possibility of having your ideas falsified, you're not doing science. And in fact, it's even worse than that because the Bible is so strongly at odds with mainstream science that it's a real challenge even to reconcile a belief in the Bible with modern science. It can be done. A lot of people manage to do it. You do. Um, but you have to twist yourself into some pretty tangled intellectual pretzels. The first thing you have to decide is if the Bible is literally true and inerrant or not. If not, then you have the problem of deciding which parts are literally true and which are not. And you obviously can't use the Bible to help you make that call. Now, I happen to know that you do believe that the Bible is 100% literally true, and that leads you to young earth creationism. And I have to say that I do admire the intellectual courage that it takes to be a YC in today's world. It's hard enough to be a creationist at all, but YC is so much at odds with the scientific mainstream that it's in the same league as flat eartherism. And in fact, it seems that even YECs draw a line at biblical literalism because the fact of the matter is that the Bible says the earth is flat because the people who wrote it thought it was. They thought that the reason that the sky was blue was because there was water up there above the firmament, Genesis 1-7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament Shamaim, which means sky, but is usually translated into English as heaven. 
Fun fact, uh, the Hebrew word for water is ma'im, which is related to shamaim, the word for sky. So you can see this worldview reflected even in the structure of the language itself. The Bible makes a lot of claims that are in violent conflict with modern science. I'll give you just one example, which isn't brought up very often. Joshua 10, 13, the Bible says that the sun stood still for about a day. Just the form of the claim is very peculiar because from a scientific point of, from a scientific point of view, because the sun doesn't actually move. It appears to move because the earth is rotating. But of course the Bronze Age people who wrote Joshua didn't know that. So did this happen? How? Did the earth stop rotating and then start up again? What happened to the rotational energy, which by the way, if you do the math is about the same as that released by several trillion atomic bombs. Why are there no records of this extraordinary event outside the Bible? The most straightforward explanation is that it never happened. That this story was simply made up by someone in order to make Joshua look like a badass. But of course, once you can see that, the whole idea of biblical inerrancy and biblical creation comes apart at the seams. So this is the problem you have. Forget Noah's Ark, forget the biology, forget the fact that no one can give a straight answer about how many kinds there are. Forget the fact that there are two different inconsistent accounts of creation in Genesis, forget all of that and just tell me how the sun stood still. And then if you manage that, we can go on to talk about the Hubble Deep Field and the Hawaiian Islands and Chaitin's theorem and the KT boundary and kangaroos and on and on and on for about 400 years of scientific progress since Isaac Newton got the ball rolling. Um, how much time do I have left? You are at about nine minutes and 15 seconds. Okay. Um, so I think I'll stop here and just try to kick off the discussion with a different question, which I'm really genuinely curious about this. Apart from the question of whether or not it's actually true that biblical creation is based in science, why would you even want to argue that? The whole point of the Bible and other holy texts, as far as I can tell, is that they contain revealed knowledge that cannot be acquired empirically. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. John 20 and 29, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The Bible itself proclaims itself, proclaims itself to be unscientific, notwithstanding what it says in Deuteronomy. It extols the virtue of faith, of belief without evidence. Um, and so, uh, so I'll just leave it at that and, and let that uh, open the discussion. I was going to close with a quote from Todd Wood, but I think I don't have time for that unless I can have the, the extra two minutes that he took. Uh, Ron, if, if you'd like, you can have the extra two minutes and okay. take your time. Yeah, no no rush here. It's going to be cordial, respectful. So go ahead. Okay. So, Ron. So, so this is something I discovered recently. It was written by by Todd Wood, who, who is self-identifies as a young earth creationist. It was written about 10 years ago, so it's apparently old news to everybody except me. But here's what Todd Wood writes. Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific ex explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it. It is not just speculation or a faith choice or an assumption or a religion. It is a productive framework for lots of biological research and it has amazing explanatory power. There is no conspiracy to hide the truth about the failure of evolution. There has really been no failure of evolution as a scientific theory. It works and it works well. I say these things not because I'm crazy or because I converted to evolution. I say these things because they are true. I'm motivated this morning by reading yet another clueless, well-meaning person pompously declaring that evolution is a failure. People who say that are either unacquainted with the inner workings of science or unacquainted with the evidence for evolution. Technically, they could also be deluded or lying, but that seems rather uncharitable to say. Oops. Creationist students, listen to me very carefully. This is still Todd Wood talking. There is evidence for evolution and evolution is an extremely successful scientific theory. That doesn't make it ultimately true and it doesn't mean that there could not possibly be viable alternatives. It is my own faith choice to reject evolution because I believe the Bible reveals true information about the history of the earth that is fundamentally incompatible with evolution. I am motivated to understand God's creation from what I believe to be a biblical creationist perspective. Evolution, it, evolution itself is not flawed or without evidence. Please don't be duped into thinking that somehow evolution itself is a failure. Please don't idolize your own ability to reason. Faith is enough. If God said it, that should settle it. Maybe that's not enough for your scoffing professor or your non-Christian friends, but it should be enough for you. All right. Okay, sweet. We got the openings out of the way and we're ready to get into the discussion. Um, so if, if 
we went going off of what we had kind of said in our powwow beforehand. Uh, SFT can go ahead and kick it off. Um, and as previously mentioned, I'll, I'll kind of cap the back and forth at around three minutes of sort of monologuing if it does get to that point, just to keep things moving along. Um, so take it away, SFT. Beautiful, beautiful. I like the sounds of that. Uh, thank you for your opening, Ron, clear and concise. Yeah, this won't take me more than three minutes. I can set my timer as well just to make sure I'll, I'll do so now. Ron talked fast, and so I wrote as much down as I possibly could. This, like I said, it's not going to um, go over the three minutes uh, that we agreed upon for rebuttals for the discussion. So appeal to majority and authority and consensus would be all logical fallacies and not a very good argument. Ron is typically guilty of a double fallacy, actually, because he not only appeals to majority, but also to experts. This doesn't work, though, because we know history itself tells mm -hmm. us that there are numerous cases where the scientific consensus was dead wrong. Just because a majority of people believe something does not make it so. Now, I do agree with Ron's definition that we have talked about before that would say that science is the process of finding the best explanations for what we observe. Biblical creation, though, explains what we observe far better than any other hypothesis, as I have clearly shown in my opening. Now, I know, uh, you know, Dr. Garrett, your PhD is not in biology, but I know you're a smart guy with probably a high Q level, and therefore I would assume that you are capable of critical thinking, and this is not to be aggressive or, or mean by any means. I'm just saying that I know you understand things other than what, say, your PhD is, and therefore, instead of just blindly, let's say, accepting the consensus, would you not want to look at the data with an open mind? For example, and I'm almost done here, I touched on a number of lines of evidence that is better explained by biblical creation. What would be your example for, um, let, let's say, what just to touch on one thing, what would be your answer, just using critical thinking skills, to the Y chromosomal evidence suggesting humans and chimpanzees are not related, which is exactly what we would expect from a biblical creation starting point. And, you know, to be respectful and, and make the discussion easy, I've got all the papers here. And here's the specific paper I'm talking about if Praise wanted to share. And that was just under two minutes. So as I'm sharing screen, you can give your thoughts, Ron. Uh, and, and I'll also share the screen for the paper for you to see. Go ahead. So I am absolutely not appealing to authority and majority. Uh, I want to make this absolutely clear. Um, I am absolutely open to the possibility that evolution could be overturned on the evidence. The, but, but the thing I am appealing to is the fact that the vast majority of biologists have not accepted the evidence that's put forth by young earth creationists as compelling. That is fact. That fact requires explanation. Now, it's possible that the correct explanation turns out to be that, well, they're just all wrong. But then you have to explain how they could all be so wrong for so long, and how could they have fooled themselves into thinking that they were right? For evolution to be overturned, that would be one of the greatest revolutions in the history of science. It would be, it, it, revolutions like that do happen there have been two of them in the entire 400 year history of science. There was the replacement of Newtonian mechanics with relativity, and then the replacement of classical mechanics uh, with quantum mechanics. This would be a revolution on a par with that. In both of those cases, it's very easy to see why scientists got it wrong. When they didn't, because they didn't really get it wrong. This is one of the characteristics of scientific progress. Both of those, two great scientific revolutions were not really an overturning of the previous theory. They were a refinement of the previous theory. Newtonian mechanics turns out to be an approximation of general relativity in the condition of weak gravitational fields and slow speeds. So Newtonian mechanics is actually correct. It just has a limited regime of applicability and general relativity extends that. Likewise, Quantum mechanics also is, it's a little bit weirder in the case of quantum mechanics, it gets more complicated. But we actually do are coming to an understanding of how classical mechanics arises from quantum mechanics. For evolution to be overturned, you would have to overturn, and, and particularly for young earth creationism to be, to turn out to be true, you would have to practically reinvent the entirety of science, including astronomy and basic physics. And, you know, the, the biology is just a detail. 
Um, with regards to the specific question that you asked me, yeah, I like to think that I'm capable of critical thinking. Um, the problem with trying to make me respond to a particular paper is I haven't read that paper. You kind of pull that on me uh, as a sneak attack. Um, if you want to reconvene with, uh, you know, give me a chance to read the paper and think about it, I'm happy to do that. But I haven't read the paper, so I can't respond to it. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for those responses, uh, Dr. Good. I definitely don't like to think that I, I sneak attack on people because typically what I do, if you've watched a number of my debates or discussions or even just daily videos, I typically do bring forth the same question. So for example, this, this paper, uh, chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content, which is exactly what one would expect from a biblical creation starting point. You wouldn't be the first person that I've presented this to. Okay, then I'm sorry, uh, I have I just haven't done my homework then. Uh, yeah, and no, and that's fine, and that's fine, because typically, you know, uh, atheists in the chat or the comment sections, they'll say, you know, standing just brought forth all the same questions and arguments, you know, because th that's the point is I am not here to to sneak attack anybody. I'm, I'm really looking for an answers. I'm really looking for. I apologize for characterizing response. it that way. Oh, no, no. no and, and that's that's completely fine. <laughs> now, what you said about the um, appeal to majority, I do believe that it is a fallacy, the appeal to majority, because Absolutely you did agree. say that um, when a person argues, so it sounds like you were arguing, you're making the claim that evolution, universal common ancestry must be true because most people believe it. Why haven't no. the majority of biologists accepted, you know, the biblical creation model? But I I'm just saying, I'm just saying that because a majority of people believe something does not make it so. And history is um, full with uh, of examples where Absolutely. the majority was, was totally wrong. So my point is, would you agree that the gold standard of science, empirical science, uh, Dr. Garrett, and, and we agree on the definite definition of science, but would you agree that the gold standard is to make testable and falsifiable predictions? Absolutely. So, and, and that's why I spent the majority of my opening covering those very testable predictions, some that have actually been confirmed from a biblical creation starting point. For example, we know that the Bible makes the very specific claim that God created two people. Adam and Eve. Therefore, this is the Bible is making very specific, may it be indirect, uh, claims about yep. genetics. For example, yes. we should expect certain things, low genetic diversity. We should expect one Y chromosomal ancestor, one mitochondrial DNA ancestor. I've got papers upon, pa here's, a, here's a technical paper from a secular journal. Gene mutations began showing up in the last 5,000 years of, of human evolution. So here's my point. There's a lot of lines of of evidence that both creation and evolution can explain. Okay, those are the lines of evidence that I always say are agnostic to the debate of creation versus evolution. For example, homology, nest and hierarchical patterns, mosaics in biology, these are all agnostic. Evolution, creation can explain the data. But there are some lines of evidence that only biblical creation could explain or evolutionary theory could explain. One of those, for example, I would assert is the Y, chromosome, uh, y chromosomal evidence that suggests, because we know the evolutionary community would say, the evolution story would say that humans and chimps are the closest related humans are uh, chimpanzees are our closest common ancestor the y chromosome and the mitochondrial dna are what's called non-recombining dna therefore the y chromosome in chimps should be most similar to that of humans humans all of our uh, y chromosomes as i said in, in my opening are extremely similar very low genetic variation and yet the chimpanzee, which is supposedly our closest cousin, is less than 70% similar. It's just, and that's why my question is, hey, listen, if evolutionary theory, if the evolutionary story is true and can better explain this data than biblical creation, then what type of answer can be provided? And if you don't have an answer for that specific one, I'm not trying to corner you. That's fine. I'm just trying to tell you that, hey, listen, I'm pointing out differentiating lines of evidence that can tell us, is the biblical creation narrative true? Is the evolutionary story true? Uh, go ahead, Ron. Yep. No, I, in broad brushstrokes, I don't disagree with anything you said, uh, except I, I would like to correct uh, one small technical error that you made. You said that chimps are our closest common ancestor. They're not. Uh, chimps are our distant cousins. Our closest common ancestor is extinct. Um, right. For example, the, the, the chimp would be our closest cousin. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I corrected myself on that. I, I believe 
that mm -hmm. I, I, I have read that we share 98% of our DNA with chimps uh, and 70% and uh, I, I think is what we share with mosquitoes, but these are not numbers I have off the top of my head. I would have to go look them up. Um, if you want to have this debate where you're getting into the biological weeds, I'm happy to do that. But then we have to really narrow the focus and you have to give me time to prepare on that very narrow focus. Well, I guess that's why my whole point is now it's not just one empirical line of evidence. It's not just one um, argument. You know, I've brought forth maybe 10, for example, just to not corner somebody on one specific example from, you know, different fields of fields of science. That's why you agreed that the gold standard of science okay. is making these it tests. All sounded like biology to me. So for example, let's, Let's look to, because I, I know that you've written a pretty extensive blog on genetic entropy. We can um, talk about that, absolutely. <laughs> so I guess what I would say then, when it comes to DNA function, you know, creationists are making very, very precise predictions on DNA function. You know, as I said in my opening, we're predicting that the vast majority of gene sequences, the, ma the vast majority of DNA elements, for example, the retrotransposons, the ALUs, the pseudogenes are functional. This would make sense. Why, the, why only the vast majority? Why not all of them? Well, I, th that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question. So I say the vast majority because of genome degradation, we would expect within that 6,000 year period, some broken genes, some junk, but not nearly as much as say an evolutionist or someone you, with an evolution. Do you subscribe to John people. Sanford's theory of genetic entropy? I would, yes. And actually, okay. if you want to respond, take your time. I just want to share screen and make it as easy as possible for you on some of these papers to get your thoughts. But I do. Yes, so I do. So, so this is something I can speak to because I have read Sanford's book. Sanford gives the rate of uh, decay in the human genome as 1% per generation. And at that rate of decay, we should be almost completely decayed at this point over the course of 4,000 years because the, the actual genetic bottleneck, according to the Bible, is actually not Adam and Eve, it's Noah, right? Right, Noah, <laughs> right. Well, and that's why I provided this paper earlier that would, because a lot of people make that common mistake, Ron, I'm glad you pointed that out, is that our, you know, most recent Y chromosomal ancestor, according to the biblical creation model, and I just want to make sure, praise your sharing screen, um, would be Adam. No, in fact, you're right, it would be Noah, and that's why this paper here, evidence for a human Y chromosome molecular clock, pedigree-based mutation rates suggest a 4,500-year history of human paternal inheritance, suggesting a, a most recent common ancestor in the Y chromosome um, being Noah. And exactly what you just said with genetic entropy. Now, a lot of that does have to do with, with DNA function. For example, if the vast majority of our genome, let's say more than 80, 85% is functional, that means those 100 new mutations per person per generation that are accumulating through our germ cell lines in the nuclear genome, those would be degenerating our biological information systems a lot faster than if the vast majority of our genome was the result of evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils. Does that make sense? So... I, I've, I've lost track of the actual claim that you're making because as, as I understand it, the hypothesis being advanced by creationism is that we were created by God and we were perfect. And that to me seems to imply that 100% of our genetic material should be coding, right? Okay, um, and then since then we've been deteriorating at Sanford says the rate of 1% per generation, which if you do the math on that, it's like 98% of our genome should have deteriorated by now. Well, I would say based on the thousands of new genetic related diseases that are entered into the database every single year, we are uh, very quickly degenerating. I mean, we are experiencing mutations at a very, very fast rate. And the, the point is, is that we are not extinct yet. That is right. That is because our human genome is not as old as, as, as say, somebody from an, a deep time evolutionary starting point would say that it is. That's why there is clearly a shelf life on genomes. But here's the thing, the evolutionists, uh, and, and you would be familiar with this, I'd imagine, because you've assessed genetic entropy, they would have to say that all of those mutations accumulate 
even in the mitochondrial DNA in the Y chromosome, we now know that uh, these uh, uniparentally inherited DNA compartments, they mutate fast. So evolutionists like Dan Grar, for example, he's um, you know, a militant evolutionist fighting the ENCODE results. They would have to say that the vast majority of our genome is junk. Therefore, when those mutations accumulate from generation to generation, they hit those junk areas, making them neutral. But what we see here, uh, hopefully it's still screen sharing. This is what I wanted to show you. Paper after paper from the secular community suggesting more and more function, even function. Are you familiar with like the retrotransposons, ERVs? Function after function in these areas that were um, before they were presumed to be junk. But creationists are the ones making the predictions. And you've admitted, uh, Ron, that that is the gold standard of science. Sure. But what's the prediction? I, as I understood it, the prediction was that 98% of our genome should have deteriorated by now. And that does not seem to be the case. Not only are we not going extinct, we are the dominant species on this planet now. There are more of us now than there have ever been before in history. Uh, we're, we're not anywhere close to going extinct. Um, so it, what is the actual well, I, no, prediction I, I, I that's would, being made that's supposed to have been vindicated by the data? I don't see it. So, for example, one of the testable predictions would be based on what we would call the created heterozygosity hypothesis. It, it once again goes back to the claims made in Genesis that God would have created two people, Adam and Eve. Now, we've talked about the mitochondrial data, the Y chromosome data, but here's the thing. When God said in Genesis to be fruitful and multiply, did he mean that to be carried out by cloning? Of course not. Therefore, we've made a prediction that God would have front-loaded Adam and Eve with pre-existing functional DNA differences and DNA elements. That's where that prediction that the vast majority of DNA sequences, DNA elements are functional. Now, here's the thing. I've made it clear that the evidence from ENCODE, the evidence from these papers that I'm screen sharing, they are preliminary. So we don't know for sure if the vast majority of DNA really is as functional as we're saying as, as biblical creationists. But we are proposing that in the future when we start doing, let's say, genetic knockout experiments, uh, obviously genetic knockout experiments are unethical on humans. We haven't done them. But through further extensive testing, we, this will reveal more and more function. From my understanding, people like Dan Grar, a lot of evolutionary biologists, they would assume the opposite because they have to or else our uh, genetics would be degenerating far too fast. You said that we should be uh, fully extinct by now. From my understanding, Dr. John Sanford gave Amazing. us a prediction of whether it's 300 generations. I'd have to double check, but Dr. John Sanford wouldn't say that we've reached that point yet, but we're coming close. And he would point to the increased rates in genetic related diseases. A lot of it is epigenetic related. We see cancer. What is it? One in three people now. We see autism is on the rise. I mean, we see disease after disease, a lot of them related yeah. to environment, a lot of them related. But that has to nothing to do with genetic entropy. That has to do with the fact that we've changed our environment through the development of technology in a way that allows people who would have died in our ancestral environment to not die. So, uh, right. Because yeah. now, so, so what you're saying is, is natural selection that we see in the wild humans have for the most part become, um, to a point where we're taking care of the sick, we are where somebody would be born with a specific genetic mutation. We're in the wild; natural selection would remove that. We've reduced the selective role. pressure. Right. We've reduced exactly. the selective pressure on ourselves through technology, and and the result of that is the survival of what in the past would have been fatal genetic traits, which aren't fatal anymore. Um, personally, I now, consider that a good thing, no, and, and I understand. I understand that. And it's entirely your, consistent with the predictions of evolution. Well, and, and here we, yes. Okay. So here we go. So what, so if we both agree that the gold standard of science is to make testable and falsifiable predictions, I've uh, brought forth many regarding the Y chromosome, genetic diversity, DNA function. Now the explanation that humans have kind of removed uh, natural selection, we're taking care of the sick, for example. Well, here's the thing that is assuming deep time evolutionary history. So our starting point, the title of the debate being is biblical creation science based. We are question we are questioning that deep time history. So therefore is genetic entropy actually degrading us from a once perfect state and in direct lines of evidence, right? There's a lot of different independent evidence, lines of evidence that are corroborating one conclusion. For example, the Y chromosome data, the mitochondrial DNA data, the data from ENCODE, and genetic entropy. So but notice, I understand notice, your explanation. Notice but that everything that you cited is biological. 
Oh, sorry, uh, Ron, go ahead. I, I didn't Everything you just yeah. cited is biology. The support for what you call deep time, the support for the evidence that supports uh, uh, an old earth and an old universe transcends biology. Biology supports that too, but we've also got geology and astronomy and physics. Right, and, but, and this is why uh, I typically point out that when it comes to the question of ancestry, what's inherited sperm and egg? Genes, traits, and genetics. This is the only direct way to determine what's related, what's not related, what's true, the biblical creation model of human origins, the evolutionary model of, of origins. Yes, we do have indirect lines of evidence like geography and, for example, dating methods, looking at rocks. A rock, geography, these things are not inherited sperm and egg, though. So when we're making predictions on DNA and molecular clocks we are doing this okay. because we are questioning the deep time assumption now here's the thing though here's the thing ron we could have easily we could have easily done these retrodictions on, uh based on the claims in genesis that god created two people adam and eve and it could have it could have come back wrong for example the evolutionary history would say that the vast majority of dna differences is the result of mutations over time we would say that the vast majority of dna differences are the result of created heterozygosity so if the data would have come back and shown that humans have high levels of genetic diversity versus the low levels of genetic diversity then that would have in a way falsified that expectation from the biblical creation model so how come you don't find any of that like how would you explain then the uh, low genetic diversity, let's say. Let's let's move on to some the, the low genetic diversity in humans. We're all 99.9999% similar, suggesting we came from uh, recent common ancestors, Adam and Eve in, in the distant past. You know, what would, what else would you expect? <laughs> That's exactly what we'd expect if Adam and Eve were, were true according to the biblical story. Go ahead, Ron. Ron, well, uh, you have about a minute 15 to respond to that if you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, So I guess I'll start by, Are you familiar? Uh, oh, yeah. by, Go by, ahead. Just, Sorry. by disputing your, your number. You said 99 point. I, I lost track of how many nines you put after it, but it, <laughs> we're it, very similar. We're very similar. It, it sounded to me like you didn't actually know the exact number and you were just reciting some random number of nines no, to emphasize the fact that we are extremely similar, but the actual I'll, I'll screen, screen share, just, standing I'm just going to screen share. Go, go ahead. And no, I'm sorry. I'm just going to screen share. Yes, go ahead and screen share. Sorry, Ron. Go ahead. Yeah. So right here, I'll just highlight it for him. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm not a biologist. All I can tell you is that the biologists know what the number is, and they do not agree that this number supports uh, a a genetic bottleneck um, uh, four thousand years ago. I also find it interesting that you keep emphasizing Adam and Eve, despite the fact that the actual genetic bottleneck predicted by biblical creation is not Adam and Eve, it's Noah. Um, right. So in fact, the, the entire biblical creation theory is unfalsifiable. Adam and Eve are scientifically unfalsifiable by your own criteria. You cannot well, no. possibly show that there was a generation before Noah, because the predictions of a created Noah would be exactly the same as their predictions of a descended Noah that had all of, of the rest of the population wiped out by a flood. <laughs> so. Well, and, and those are some good points and good questions. That's why I agree with you that the most recent Y chromosomal ancestors, so when we make these direct predictions on molecular clocks, they can be falsified if these pedigree-based mutation rate studies where we look at trio studies, for example, and we look at the empirical rate and we can take it back. And like I've said, the FBI has adopted that fast mutation rate in the mitochondrial DNA, but the Y chromosome we now mutate, uh, we know mutates fast. And based on high sequencing data, this could have been falsified. This could have been wrong, but the mutations, the amount of mutations that exist in the Y chromosome, remember the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, these are non-recombining DNA compartments. So they're the best to look at when it comes to molecular 
clocks. With the nuclear genome, we inherit two copies, of course. It gets a little bit messy. So this didn't have to be true. And you said with the genetic bottleneck, you're right. That's why I pointed to, um, I'm screen sharing again. But here's this study that I pointed to fast. You might even be familiar with this one. So it's the DNA barcoding study where they looked at the highly conserved mitochondrial DNA protein, the CO1 gene. Uh, let me see. I'm screen sharing if Praise wants to show it. Oh, right here. So it says, in analyzing the barcodes across 100,000 species, Ron, the researchers, Praise, make sure you're screen sharing, please. The researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals emerged about the same time as humans. This isn't creationists discovering this data and one of the researchers even said that he fought this conclusion as hard as he could so this is exactly what we'd expect the low genetic diversity in over a hundred thousand species in the co1 gene in the, in the mitochondria showing us yeah that bottleneck at the flood that bottleneck at uh the time of noah is is exactly what we would expect. This didn't ha have to come back to be true, is my point, Ron. You know, what what, what are your thoughts on this on this data? So I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that data. Um, I did just look up mitochondrial Eve because that's something that I that I had heard about. Uh, mitochondrial Eve, uh, according to uh, Wikipedia, um, uh, was uh, one hundred and fifty thousand years ago. So. Um, no, was so. I'm, if you just look that up, yeah. So that's why I brought forth these sources. So I'm still screen. Sorry, 180,000 to 580,000 years ago, and I'm right. perfectly willing to accept that. No, no, no. So, for example, th this is why I made it uh, clear in my my opening here that, um, and even the evolutionary papers, the secular papers will agree. Many of these studies continue to rely on what phylogenetic analyses of MT DNA. These are all based on assumptions. So what they're doing is they're not looking at the empirical rate, you know, the fast mutation rates that we see today from pedigree-based studies, Ron. What they do is they take the empirical rate and then they calibrate it. And I've got it over and over again here. They admit that they calibrate the data with the assumed history of the geologic column. That's not the empirical method. The question in point is the deep time geological column. We are trying to make direct predictions from a biblical based model and a biblical based starting point. That's why we're happy with the empirical rate. It's fast. We have a paper here where we actually know Eve's sequence. We've we've determined what the mitochondrial Eve sequence is. Paper here, the Eve mitochondrial consensus sequence. I'm happy to send all of these to you, Ron. But the empirical rate does confirm uh, that we have descended from two two common ancestors, Adam and Eve. Now, the evolutionists would say that there is a hypothetical population bottleneck, roughly 50 to 100,000 years ago in Africa, which reduced levels of heterozygosity to explain the low genetic diversity. But now we're just getting into a whole nother can of worms because we know that that out of Africa scenario would have involved uh, incredible inbreeding resulting in recessive mutations that are deleterious coming to the forefront, reducing, um, you know, levels of heterozygosity. That's what uh, inbreeding does is those genetic mistakes that have been accumulating are now manifested. So that's a disastrous bottleneck. So there's problems there with the evolutionist explanation. But yet all of this data, all of this empirical data is perfectly consistent with the biblical base starting point. And that's the title of the of the Actually, debate. Actually, it's, it's not. The, the population bottleneck that you're referring to uh, was a population of a few tens of thousands of individuals, which is a really small population. That really is on the verge of extinction. Right. Right. But it's not, it's not two individuals. And even mitochondrial Eve does not demonstrate that we went through a bottleneck that consisted of two individuals. All it demonstrates is that all humans are descended from one female. Now, but, here's the thing, though. There's no, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead, Ron. But that doesn't mean that uh, that this one female gave, that, that her line gave birth to the, to the entire population. It just means that we all, everybody who's alive today has a common ancestor in this one female. But that's also kind of, that's not surprising because the higher, the, the more generations you go back, the more ancestors you have. You have two parents, four grandparents, eight grandparents, great, uh, eight great grandparents, 16 great, great grandparents, so on and so forth. The further you go back, the more likely it is that you will share an ancestor with a, a, a given person. And you go back far enough, it's, 
I haven't done the math, but my guess is that it's probably a, a mathematical certainty that you would find a single person who happens to be a common ancestor of everybody who's alive today. It's not surprising at all. And it certainly doesn't demonstrate that the human population ever consisted of two individuals. Um, okay, so there's a few things I want to comment. And actually, you brought up a lot of good points there. So that's going to spark some good conversation. Now, the question is, and I've asked this question uh, numerous times, I've, I've kind of pointed it out in my opening, is the question of where does genetic diversity come from? So the, the big major difference between my view that I'm proposing based on the biblical creation starting point and say the evolutionist view, which you've made it clear that you hold to, is that we as biblical creationists explain the vast majority of nuclear DNA differences not by mutation. Okay, the evolutionists say that this has all been a process of genetic mistakes over millions and millions of years. We explain them by pre-existing or created genetic heterozygosity or created genetic diversity. Now here's the thing, here's the thing. This has very, very serious implications on the effects of bottlenecks. It has serious implications on the timing as to the origin of species. Now, for example, if you're trying to explain the origin of species just by mutations, yes, I agree. You need millions of years for all these differences to accumulate. That's the evolutionary model. But if these differences are there from the start, as I've proposed, then just the basic operation of, say, recombination, gene conversion, other processes, of course, can produce visible variety in a single generation. When it comes to the bottlenecks, though, it's a serious problem, Ron, for you and the evolutionary story is because what? You explain all the or you, you explain the vast majority of DNA differences, if not all DNA differences, as a result of mutations over time. So by the time you reach that bottleneck 70,000 years ago in Africa, all of these genetic mistake, mistakes that have been accruing for millions of years, now they come to the forefront leading to rapid and accelerated genetic degeneration. It's not a problem for us at the time of Noah, eight people, Noah, his wife, the three um, daughters-in-law and his three sons, which if we got into the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, we know there's three L, M, and N consistent with, um, once again, the flood bottleneck. But here's the thing. Those DNA differences are the result of creation, according to our model. Therefore, the effects of mutations wouldn't be such a serious impact as it would be, say, for the evolutionary story. Yeah, by the time, uh, you know, the flood took place, let's say 4,500 years ago, there would have been some mutations that have uh, accumulated through the germ cell lines, but not nearly as much as the evolutionary story would suggest. So how do you deal with that serious inbred population of say, you said about 10, I've got a source here that says 3,000. They kind of just throw around numbers. They don't know for sure. They're just looking at the genetic diversity in humans and, and coming up with hypotheses. But how would you explain that severe inbreeding problem according to the out of Africa story, Ron? I, I don't understand what you think needs to be explained. It, it's just a fact that sometime, that according to the data, that sometime in our past, probably on the order of hundreds of thousands of years ago, the human population went through a, a bottleneck and we almost went extinct. The exact numbers, debatable. Uh, tens of thousands seems reasonable to me. I'm not a biologist, so I can't really have an, a, an informed opinion about that. But I don't understand why you think that this is a problem for evolution. It just, it, it that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And by the well, way, I also take issue with your characteristic characterization of mutations as mistakes. Uh, mutations are not mistakes. They're just random changes. And uh, it, it, to characterize them as, as, as mistakes, um, makes implications that are that are false uh it it to to have a to to make a mistake implies that there is some measure of correctness that you that you have gone against and there isn't even any such concept in evolutionary theory so just the form of your argument makes it suspect the fact that I'm having a hard time understanding the problem that you're trying to bring to my attention. The fact that I can't even understand the, the predictions that you're actually making and how they're different from, uh, from the predictions that evolution uh, makes. It's, you're, you're, you're talking too fast, you're using too many big words. You know, you, you think, I think you think I'm smarter than I actually am and better informed than I actually am. <laughs> I, I do see you as a smart, well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll say this simple, okay? Mm -hmm. If, 
if the um, I would say that, you know, the definition of a mutation is random changes in the nucleotide sequence. Now, whether those are all neutral, nearly neutral, whether there are some beneficial mutations, that might be a question for an, another day. I like to I like to say it's akin to a typographical error in the text. I would say the more functional the genome is, the more deleterious these mutations are. But yeah, I agree. If okay, so let's to, cl let's clear that up once and right, for and all. that's what I wanted to clear up. That's what I. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to try and make it simple, even for the audience too. So if evolution is true. And this has all just been a process of genetic mutations, okay? Let's assume and that- And natural is, selection. Of course, natural Very selection. Very important. Upon, <laughs> so natural selection acts upon the random variation, the random variation right. due to the genetic mutations. Yes. So here's the thing though. If this is true, just like Dan Grar, just like evolutionary biologists, they'll say, and this is what they expect, they expect that the, the, our genomes, the genomes of living organisms should reflect um, the nested hierarchical patterns in the biological world, the world that is the result of descent with modification. Therefore, we should find pseudogenes, uh, you know, the ancient remnants of viral infections. We should find evolutionary leftovers junk. So what I'm saying here about the function of these DNA differences and that Adam and Eve were front loaded with these DNA differences, I'm saying that model could be falsified if it can be shown, if it can be demonstrated that the vast majority of the genome really is, really is the result of evolutionary processes and therefore evolutionary leftovers. But like I said earlier, I'll say one more point and, and take your time is they never predicted, they were shocked to find that these non-protein coding RNAs, they literally regulate virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway. Pseudogenes, they always said these pseudogenes were genetic mistakes. They look at these genetic mistakes in chimps and humans, and they say that we inherited them from a, a common ancestor, when in fact, we know that these pseudogenes actually harbor the potential to regulate their protein coding cousins. There's so much more going on the genome than anybody ever expected. And this is this is exactly what we would expect. We're making predictions. But as far as I know, Ron, and maybe you can correct me, I don't see any real testable predictions coming from the evolutionary community on levels of DNA function. Uh, go ahead. I hope that cleared it up a little bit. No, I'm afraid it didn't. But, I, but there are some things I'd like to say about what you said. Um, our understanding of the mechanism by which D the, in the information encoded in DNA uh, gets translated and transcoded into a phenotype, um, that understanding continues to advance and, and evolve for want of a better term. Uh, and we keep discovering new mechanisms by which it happens. And it's really cool and complicated and interesting and, and nature keeps surprising us. None of those discoveries have ever been a threat to the underlying model of evolution because the details of the transfer function and how a, a, a genotype is translated into its phenotype is completely irrelevant to the functioning of evolution. Um, evolution just acts by essentially doing a random exploration of the search space of possible genotypes and of self-replicating systems. And the ones that are more successful at replicating persist and the ones that are less successful die out. And that's just the way it works. And the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I didn't want to interrupt you, Ron. Go ahead. Um, well, I was about to finish, so. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No, I just, I know, because you're right. When we go on for too long, then we miss points. It gets confusing. So I guess maybe the, the best question I can ask then, because scientists, you know, within even the evolutionary community, they disagree, you know? And I know there's one, Dan Grar, for example. They disagree about details, with, not about exactly. the big picture. Oh. Right, right. They never question the big picture. That's why typically, uh, you know, um, P proponents of evolutionary theory and critics of biblical creation, they'll say, well, you know, why aren't PhD scientists that hold to uh, a young earth creation view? Why are they not publishing in peer reviewed secular journals? Well, that's the thing. You can question the details and they do, but you can't question the bigger picture. But well, you, you have creation. You can journal. question the bigger picture. So you just you have to support your questioning picture. with evidence. Right. But here's the thing. I've got um, a mixture here of secular papers and creationist papers. And these creationist papers, there hasn't been any sufficient responses to them. They're back 
backing up their conclusions with solid data. But here's the thing. Those papers and the data in those papers are questioning the bigger picture. Okay. That is not allowed. Only the details are allowed. But here's here's I just want to ask the question, then we can continue on that if you'd like. Dan Grar, he's been, he, he's been um, militant against the ENCODE project. And he's come out with a paper recently, and I've discussed this with, with numerous serious students of evolutionary theory, that no more than 15 or 20 percent of the genome can be functional so everything you're talking about what we know about regulation gene expression function in these retro transposons yes but somebody like dan grar and i know he's not the only one he's not a creationist of course they'll say that all of those functions have to be within that 15 or 20 percent because remember like we talked about earlier genetic entropy those mutations that accumulate the evolutionist needs those to hit okay. in those junk so, areas look, making them neutral go ahead go I've, ahead i've already told you i'm not a biologist i can't speak to these details why do you keep harping on this um i i i've i've done half a dozen of these debates now everyone i will do the same thing that i've done every other one send me the links to the papers i will read them We'll reconvene and then we can talk about the details after I've had a chance to inform myself. In the meantime, the burden of proof is on you right. to I agree. show how I agree. all right. of the data, not just the biology, but the geology and the astronomy and the physics, all of it can be reconciled with your claim that the universe is only 6,000 years old because that is off from the accepted figure by, I forget, seven orders of magnitude. It, it's like trying to say that the distance from LA to New York is, uh, I think it turns out to be six feet. Um, it's just an enormous difference. And you, you will have trouble accounting for things like the Hubble Deep Field. We have actual photographs of literally billions of galaxies. If the universe is only 6,000 years old, there just isn't enough room for all those galaxies to fit without the whole thing collapsing into a black hole. So, uh, okay, let me, um, I, I can address that one too. I've just, I've got a bunch of things written down that I want to make sure that we, and, and I understand, I'm going to send you all these papers. That's why I did the uh, diligence and the courtesy of throwing all these paper and papers and slideshows, just so I'm not throwing things at you, Ron, you know, in that you can at least see the papers, the data, and, I, and I'm going to send them all to you. But one thing that I do want to comment on, and then I can also, when it comes to geology, when it comes to astronomy, genetics, biology, there's prediction. I mean, we're just talking about tens of, you know, a multitude of predictions just from genetics and biology. And the burden of proof is on me. That's why I did my best to show you direct predictions okay. that flow no, from the starting point of, of geneticists. Now, that's, yeah. That's great. And I applaud that, but your focus is much too narrow. You're no, focusing no, entirely right. on the biology and you're ignoring everything did, else. And there's a lot you, else. I did tell you why I focus heavily, because when it comes to the question of ancestry and origins, the only direct line of evidence, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, is genetics. You know, this is how we can determine no, that's not true. ancestry. Well, direct, we have indirect lines of evidence like you've pointed out, like geology, astronomy. But when it comes to ancestry, it's genes, traits, and genetics. That's what's inherited, sperm and egg. That's what we can use to trace back and determine what's true. The human origins, uh, you know, of version. Okay, I guess from it depends generation. on what you consider direct. I would consider the fossil record to be direct evidence also because we can actually you know, see the critters. But, uh, okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll ask a, a basic question then. What's yep. your definition of, of species, biologically speaking? What difference does that make? Well, here's the thing. This is why the fossil record is indirect, because if your definition of species, which I think is the prevailing view, is an interbreeding population, we need the genetics to determine that. When you look to the fossil record, for example, you don't have genetics. You just have some bones found in the dirt that we, oftentimes there's more variation within the same species than between species. For example, Canis domesticus has more variation within itself than across Canis lupus, Canis domesticus, Canis coyotes. So therefore, when you're looking at fossils, how Ron, how can you determine what's the, the result, let's say morphologically speaking, what's the result of recent relationship or what's the result of conversion evolution? You know, independent evolutionary history. Because, how can the you fossil, tell that because the fossils are analyzed within the context of a model of geology 
that explains how the fossils came to exist in the first place. And then you can, from that, deduce the relative ages of the fossils and, the, and, and you can also look at where they were found. Right, right. And, and that's a good point. That's a good point. If I can touch on that real quick. Here's the thing, though. Real, real fast before you go ahead, Danny, and then I'll let you continue. Uh, we've got about five more minutes of discussion uh, before five minute closers each and then the Q&A. So just to Beautiful. let you guys know, continue. Beautiful. So my point that there's oftentimes and this isn't disagreed upon, believe it or not, you know, I've gotten this from watching Aaron Ra's phylogeny series. So even he would agree. And he's the, you know, supposedly the phylogeny expert. So the fact that there's more variation within the same species oftentimes than between or across species, if all the dogs today, the 450 breeds of dogs, the variations within Canis domesticus, let's say they all fossilized due to some catastrophic flood. It could be a local flood. Thousands of years from now, if those fossils were to be dug up, there would be all sorts of interpretations. They would probably conclude that your Great Dane or your Chihuahua or your Husky are different species when in fact they're variations within the same domesticated species. And this is the same problem that they find in the fossil record. I have a book by Bernard Wood, famous paleo expert, who admits this exact same thing. He says it's oftentimes difficult to distinguish between convergent evolution and um, you know some species that actually share recent sure. common ancestors. Like this, sure. is, this is why it's, fossils are oftentimes difficult. It's entirely and, possible that some of our reconstruction of the past, of past events have some mistakes in them. But none of those mistakes are a serious threat to the proposition in general. And by the way, uh, th this is actually something that creationists agree on. Creationists don't, I, I've never heard a creationist claim that there was one of every breed of dog on the ark. There, there was just one pair of the dog kind, right? And so all of the mod all of modern dogs have descended from from one pair of dogs on the ark. So the this idea that uh, that evolution or some natural process that plays out over time can produce a tremendous amount of phenotypical diversity is is accepted by everyone. The only disagreement is over how many roots the tree of life has, and one of the reasons why young earth creationism is suspect as a scientific theory is because no one pinned down the number of kinds that were on the ark. That's really important. If you're going to claim that the number of roots of the evolutionary tree is greater than one, you can't just wave your hands and say, well, there was some number. You have to make a precise claim. And then... <laughs> Okay, so actually, those are good points. That might be, since we only have a couple minutes left, that might be uh, something for an, another other debate. I've had whole debates on speciation rates. So based on what we know of on speciation rates, the number of species that exist on the planet, I've got a 30 page technical paper from Dr. Jensen where they do just that. They go over the number of kinds that would be on the ark and they made specific predictions on the number of species we should see today. Let's say within dogs, cats, birds, for example, birds is, is a great example because oftentimes cats, you've only got about 30 species, bears, you've got eight species, dogs, you've only got a few species. These are easy. When you go to birds, you've got about 10 to 12,000 species. Therefore, we would predict just last year, I've got a paper here, I won't screen share it for sake of time, but they've discovered new species of finch on the Galapagos Islands. And it was the result of shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity. I know that's technical, but this was a direct prediction from Dr. Nathaniel uh, Jensen on speciation. Right now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we're seeing new bird species before our very own eyes, okay, then logically, we can conclude, okay, 10 to 12,000 birds species today, roughly two to three a year for 4,500 years. That makes sense. Then you've got the evolutionary theory that says birds today descended from theropod-like dinosaurs, you know, 65 million years ago. And yet all we have is 10 to 12,000 bird species today. They will admit they can't make predictions because now they have to invoke massive extinction events to explain why are there so few species of animals today, bird, bats, lizards, reptiles, bears, dogs, cats. It's all in line with young earth creation expectations. I've got one other thing I want to address, but I'll save it for my closing because we only had five minutes. I don't want to dominate. You can have the last word if you'd like, Ron. Um, I'll say 
it sounds like what we should do is you should send me some papers and I should read them and we should and then we should have a, a reconvene and and dive into the details. I'm happy to do that. Um, I just didn't know that that's what you were going to want to do. So I can't do it because I haven't read the papers. Sorry. All right, let's launch into the closings if that's all right with everyone. <laughs> yeah, of course. And standing uh, started. Um, standing, would you like to? I, I don't know typically how we do this. I, sure. Do yeah. To... Yeah. Because I started, I can start as well. Yeah, that's kind of what um, I was thinking. Okay, just give me a minute, warning. I'll just kind of go. Will I'll try do. to all the all the notes I have. I'll try to. I don't like leaving anything hanging. So. Yeah, no problem. I'll turn on your first word. Beautiful. Yeah, go ahead. So I want to, once again, I want to thank Dr. Garrett. Um, you know, it's, I've got a lot of respect for him. He's been on my channel many times. I've really enjoyed this discussion. Hour and a half has already flown by. So um, yeah, nothing, but I'd, I'd be happy with, with a few more debates. Now, my goal since the debate was, you know, is biblical creation science-based? Well, he agreed. Um, and that's why I made it my, my goal to ask that question right away. Would you agree that the gold standard of science is to make testable and falsifiable predictions? And I've brought forth countless of testable and falsifiable predictions. Some that future observations will prove to either be true or false. Some that have come true already. This is the gold standard of science. The evolutionary community or somebody with a different hypothesis, different worldview, they're going to have to man up. They're going to have to make predictions of their own. One thing I had written down was uh, he was stating that the evolution story would expect, you know, the one mitochondrial DNA ancestor, the one Y chromosome ancestor, when in fact there is every possibility that we would have found multiple diverse mitochondrial lineages within modern people that say some or all of these would be shared with chimpanzees, of course, if ape to man evolution is, is true. This is not what was found, which is why, and I brought this up in my opening and we talked about it in the discussion, this is why coalescence was brought in to explain all the differences. It all depends on what Dr. Robert Carter would explain as historical demographics. So now here's the thing, here's the thing. This coalescence and calibrating the empirical, um, the empirical rate, the empirical data with the fossil record, this coalescence, it was a post hoc evolutionary explanation brought in after the fact after the relevant data was uh, derived. Now, here's the thing. This is the same with the uh, low genetic diversity data that suggests that we came from just two people thousands of years ago. They invoked, once again, the, the hypothetical population bottleneck. Evolutionists explained the vast majority of DNA differences as a result of mutation. That out of Africa population bottleneck would have been incredibly damaging, and yet we're supposed to believe that that hypothetical population of 10 to 30,000, you can even have 30,000, suddenly spread out in all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet. Another prediction, creations have been saying for years, I've got slide after slide, uh, the discussion flew by too quick. I couldn't show it, but Neanderthals, we've always said that Neanderthals are just a human variant and we've got plenty of lines of evidence in all types of fields that that's exactly what they were. They were highly inbred. This is what the data uh, suggests. The data suggests that these hominin, uh, you know, so-called hominins were just uh, post-babel people groups that experience accelerated nuclear um, genetic degeneration. He did bring up um, dating methods kind of at the end there kangaroos kinds we did talk about kinds you know and the speciation rates the the numbers of kinds it's it's been figured out the testable predictions have been made it's all in line with uh, young earth creation time scales dating methods are indirect lines of evidence genetics are direct in determining ancestry dating methods rely on a whole host of unprovable and unknowable assumptions plus the rate team has discovered uh, plenty of lines for accelerated nuclear decay in the rocks themselves radio halos fish and tracks helium helium and zircon crystals that the evolutionists say are billions of years old or hundreds of millions of years old helium is incredibly slippery what's it doing found in zircon crystals carbon soft dinosaur tissue i mean all the evidence is in line even if you want to look to fossils and rocks and dating methods you know they're dating method they're they're dating rocks of known age and they're coming up with dates of hundreds of millions of years old why would we trust trust dates from uh, rocks of unknown age if they can't even get accurate dates from rocks of known age. So, you know, it's just all nonsense, the indirect lines of evidence. And the only other thing I didn't address in the next, in the last 30 one seconds, minute. I have, one minute was the, uh, I guess the galaxies, the distant starlight. I'd be happy to debate that with uh, Dr. Garrett at a time. 
most convenient for him. I'm fascinated by the gravitational time dilation model as well as Dr. Jason Lyle's model. For example, I'm not sure if he's familiar with the time dilation model, but that would suggest that God may have created stars and galaxies, while the Earth, Dr. Russell Humphrey says, was deep inside a gravitational well, which actually causes Earth clocks to slow down to the point where it would even stop. Now, after, as we know, based on the Bible, since our starting point is the Bible, God stretched out the heavens, earth would have come out of that well first, and then time starts ticking at that point. But since stars and galaxy, galaxies did not experience time dilation, and this is all uh, consistent with Einstein's uh, science and theory, of course, the universe could be around billions of years old relatively speaking, appearance speaking, while the earth itself is only thousands of years old. So there's a few models that have uh, solved the problem that he said was a problem. So we can discuss that in the future as well. And looks like I addressed everything I had written down. So I enjoyed the debate and go ahead, Dr. Garrett. I really appreciated you doing this. Uh, likewise, I uh, appreciate you engaging. Um, I wanna address my, I didn't really prepare a closing um, and, and even if I had, it probably would have been off topic just because of the way the discussion went. So I'm gonna to have to uh, wing this. And I wanna address this to the audience because um, SFT threw an awful lot of stuff at me and most of it I wasn't able to respond directly to. And so what I'd like to do instead is draw your attention to the form of his, his argument. Um, it's uh, it, it's a kind of logical fallacy called a gish gallop, where what you do is just throw one fact after another after another at somebody who at the beginning has told you that they're not prepared to respond specifically to those facts. Notice that all of them up until his closing, he focused entirely on biology and ignored, as I said, the geology and the astronomy and the physics. Um, which those are, are actually much easier to refute and much more within my area of expertise. Um, he gave you the impression that there is this overwhelming mountain of evidence that supports biblical creation. So think to imagine to yourself, what would the world be like if he was actually right about that? The venue for resolving these sorts of disputes is not here in a debate forum on YouTube. It's in the scientific process, which is boring and time consuming. It doesn't make good television. And that's the reason it's not done here. Um, it's done in journals. It's done by people submitting papers and reading papers. And it's not a very exciting process. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, and the YC community has failed to make its case in that forum. This is not to say that they're wrong because I'm not arguing from authority. I'm not arguing from arguing from majority. But the fact that they have failed, the fact that they have failed to persuade is a fact that requires explanation. So what's the explanation? May, well, I don't know. Maybe there's a conspiracy. Maybe all of the people who are rejecting the creationist papers are idiots. Um, maybe, I, Maybe that we're, I don't know, I had uh, 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 Kent Hovind um, advance the hypothesis that we're, we're all sticky, clinging to evolution in order to satisfy our lusts. And he has some biblical verse to support that. Uh, it all seems very bizarre to me. He also starts talking about North Korea and throwing people in gulags. I don't quite understand it, but it is a fact that requires explanation. Moreover, how do we ever come up with this crazy idea that the universe is 13 billion years old in the first place if it's, if it's that far off? Where did that crazy idea ever come from? Well, it came from the data. And that's the reason that we believe all these things is because there is a mountain of data to support it. It's possible that it's wrong. It would be a great advance in science if somebody could actually make the case that it's wrong, but nobody has, nobody's even come close. And I look forward to a rematch where we can actually dig into some of the, de the biological details when I'm better prepared. All right, sweet. Thank you guys. All right, I think this is, we have reached the part of our show where we're going to go ahead and dive into the question and answer section. So Eve Price has probably emailed me 
the old uh, Q&A list. So I'll check. Um, I guess I'm still waiting on it. In the meantime, I will go ahead and answer some of the, or go ahead and go through some of the super chats that we have on the side visible to me now. Um, so for, and, and in praise, in praise in the meantime, if you'll just shoot me those cues, that would be great. Uh, so for $2 from Timothy Bryce, uh, he says Stupid Horror Energy is the cat's pajamas. So, you know, we got we got a fan out in the audience for one of our regular question askers. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say SWE, you know, I, I love her. She She's there supporting every debate I host. And I say it all the time. She's put my kids through college. She gives the best super chat. So we love her in this. Um, so from LPP for $2, that's Logical, Plausible, Probable, or John Maddox. For those of you who know him, he has come on a he couple of He still owes me papers. <laughs> <laughs> that's a call out, John. John's getting called out. He's not even Ron and John have a, uh, a love-hate relationship. Uh, <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to hear that. We, we, love, a, we love a healthy, a healthy band here on modern day debate um and he says don't miss the after show so he's hosting an after show over on his channel um i myself am hosting after show. Uh, so go to after shows they're great um they're open mic. my lpp typically holds an open mic i myself don't um but you know go go you know hear hear what people have to say i think that's that's always good practice check my email again all right i think here we have nope not yet Praise, I'm going to kill you, dude. Praise, you have one job, and as usual, you failed. <laughs> Praise gets paid a huge amount he was, of money. He was so close to finally getting that raise for me, and once again, I'm sorry. We're going back to the time. I about it. So I'm, you know, I'm about to come over and you know hunt you down and ask you nicely to do a better job. All right. All right. For, for $5 from Super Cool Energy. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. I can see most of them in the side anyways. We're just going backwards. We'll have to meet it in the middle. Uh, from Stupid Horror Energy for $5. Um, SFT, I think this is probably directed at you, uh, but both of you can answer it if you'd like. Uh, she says, that barcode shite only points to the last time a bottleneck happened. That's why you're seeing young dates. Mito mitochondrial clocks. She says mito clocks, but short for mitochondrial clocks. Uh, can indeed get reset. So right. hey, what do you think? Right. That is the exactly what I pointed out in the discussion in my opening regarding even the mitochondrial Eve Y chromosome atom, um, the DNA barcoding study, of course. When you assume evolutionary history, deep time evolutionary history, you're going to have to invoke bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck, extinction event after extinction event, when in fact this empirical data is perfectly consistent. It's exactly what we would expect from the biblical creation starting point. Therefore, we don't need to invoke bottleneck after bottleneck. We don't need to calibrate these dates with the geological column. So that's the whole point. But what she's saying is true. That would be the evolutionary explanation. Awesome. All right. You got anything to add to that, Ron? Feel free. Yeah. The evidence shows that there have been lots of extinction events in the past. Uh, in fact, uh, something in the neighborhood of 90, close to 99% of all the species that have ever existed on Earth are extinct today. And in fact, we're in the midst of another major extinction event that uh, is, is is just winding up as a result of, of human activity. Yep, yep. Superb, but in a sad way. Um, all right, so a question Very for Ron from George Bond for five Australian dollars. He says, I can't find any observable evidence uh, on co-option in Wikipedia. Where can I find this evidence? Co-option? Yes. Is, is that for me? Yes. I have. I don't know what co-option is. I don't think I ever use that word. Co-option. I, I can. I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. So, uh, co-option has to do with the endogenous retroviruses and the uh, other various subclasses or classes of the retrotransposons because the, the the numerous papers that I showed in my opening and in the discussion that shows how functional these ERVs are and, and they've got crucial functions that some of the papers that I showed, the regulating genes, determining cell types. So the evolutionists now, you know, they can't admit that these could possibly just be created units of DNA function. They need to hold on to the fact that these are just the ancient remnants of past viral infections. So now they say that these functions were co-opted or adopted by the endogenous retrovirus. But I've asked numerous times for a technical paper that can show us empirically 
a non-functional ERV going from non-functional to functional. So I just say that claiming they were co-opted is mere uninformative gloss. It's storytelling. All right, Ron, you can add on to it. It's your question. You can have the last word uh, if you so desire. That's right. I have, I have no idea what's even being discussed here. So. <laughs> Okay, Erica, you can have the last word then. Uh, listen, I, I, I am in unbiased mod mode as I keep testing me in the side chat. I refuse to comment. So you're um, good. You're good. Hey, that's why I'm always happy to have you as mod. Hey, I know. Well, it's not always easy. Yeah, you you, you better look outstanding. Ron's going to come back at you on this next debate. He's going to be red. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. It was a lot of fun. I like Ron. All right. Awesome. That's You know what? That's more excuses to have more conversations. I love it. Uh, hey, maybe we can have a full trilogy like Erica and I did. Uh, standing, I keep, yeah, we're, we we need to add another, we got to have a second trilogy on oh, that. Oh, we got to have a, oh, okay. I know. I know. <laughs> Something to look forward to. For five bucks, she says, as we seek, and I'm assuming this is directed at you, Standing. Um, she likes to come for you sometimes. She uh, does, yes. As we sequence new genomes, we're finding fewer orphan genes. Uh, this seems to go against the creationist prediction. Um, so I would have to see, I guess, the technical papers that are uh, showing fewer and fewer orphan genes because what I'm – um, what I know about orphan genes is the fact that what they are doing in the papers is they are claiming de novo gene synthesis, that these orphan genes have popped up from non-coding regions. Now, this is all based on inference assumption. So if these papers, they're now trying to say, okay, you know, we've now found – relatives for these orphan genes that we're saying is consistent with the model of um, biblical kinds, I'd have to see if it's anything more than them just labeling de novo gene synthesis because they can't just admit that these are fully functional gene sequences integrated into the um, you know biological organisms by a designer, of course. So I'd be happy to look at those papers and, and see what their conclusion is. Good question. Yeah, super whore energy. She always has good questions. She, she always does. She's always, you know, she pays close attention. I, I know I appreciate it. Um, from Brandon Ardeline for $5. Um, I, I feel like this is probably directed at you standing, but <laughs> that means, Ron, feel free to, to uh, chime yeah. in. Uh, this is kind of an open uh, kind of comment, I believe, just on the debate in general. Uh, he says, science isn't, quote, the majority of people believing the same thing, unquote. It is the majority of people testing the same theory and getting the same results. Right. So I guess I can, it's probably more so at me. So that's why I asked Ron at the beginning, you know, what do you agree is the gold standard of, of science? It's testable predictions. The winner of, you know, but I'm not saying there is a winner and a loser, but the best hypothesis, the best model is going to come down to who's making the best testable predictions. And I think I've shown and demonstrated over and over again that it is the uh, creationists that are bringing forth the best testable predictions. And not only that, so many predictions are being confirmed. And I look forward to the results in the future uh, through further observations on some of the other testable predictions, for example, on like the Khoisan peoples and the history of civilization and our mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome. So uh, go ahead, Ron. You can have the last word on that. Uh, this is a, a, a sincere, non-rhetorical question. If what you say is true, why is it not being accepted by mainstream science? A good question. So a lot of mainstream science hasn't even, uh, they're not even aware of these technical papers that are coming out from, you know, in, in creationist journals, for example, they're not aware of any of this evidence. I would predict that if I were to get in a discussion or a debate with some of these mainstream scientists, they would probably not even be aware of many of these testable predictions. And the thing is, when it comes to the secular journals, like I said earlier, they're allowed to question the details. But when you bring forth a paper, let's say Dr. Jeanson, a Harvard graduate, say he, he tried to publish his Y chromosomal predictions in a secular journal, they are going to see right off the bat that he's not just questioning the details. He's questioning the deep time. He's questioning evolutionary theory, universal common ancestry. It's not allowed. It, it's it's the details, like Ron was saying earlier, that, that can be questioned. But you've got separate creationist journals. The mainstream scientists are fully capable of going and responding, and they can submit their own paper. And there hasn't been many challenges to these papers. So um, go ahead, Ron. Uh, it's not that challenging all these things is not allowed. It's that you have to provide supporting evidence for all of the things that you are challenging. And if you're challenging 
I'll go ahead and use the word deep time, although that's not really accurate, uh, then you have to provide supporting evidence to re-explain all of the things in science that have been explained in terms of a universe that's 13 point something billion years old. You can't just hand wave that away. And that's what young earth creationists are doing. Right. And I would just say, um, I guess my last word on that one would be uh, we could have separate debates in geology, astronomy. In geology, there's been some very fascinating uh, testable predictions from Dr. John Baumgartner on the catastrophic plate tectonics regarding um, re regarding uh, cold slabs found in, in Earth's mantle, huge confirmation of the global flood model. So it's not just genetics, biology. There's predictions on the magnetic fields in our solar system in, in astronomy. So yeah, we focused on, on genetics and biology, but there's predictions coming from creation scientists in all sorts of fields. So I, I agree. It's not just one or two fields. We have to look at it as a whole, and that is being done. That's being done. All right, for $10 from Stupid Whore Energy, as she likes to be called, uh, SFP, it's not really that surprising with respect to the Y chromosome that such variable regions of human DNA would be quite different from chimpanzees. So it's not quite surprising, but then I don't see any real argument or evidence backing that up. I've seen numerous um, explanations, faster rates of gene conversion. I've seen, um, I guess, the ape slowdown hypothesis. Like, of course, Erica, you said. So, I mean, these are things we can we can discuss. Uh, I don't know what explanation SWE would hold to, so I don't really know how to respond. So is it is it surprising? Is it not surprising? Well, I know that the paper that I provided when the scientists first discovered the dissimilarity between humans and chimps in the Y chromosome, they were surprised. They made the point that this is what they expected when it comes to the autosomes. This is what they expected in humans and chickens. <laughs> but yet th these were the differences that they found in humans and chimps. So it was a surprise. It was a surprise. Okay, for five dollars from logical, plausible, probable, uh, another awesome debate. Don't miss the epic after show. Kicks off right after the debate ends. Open mic, and that is on LPP's channel. Uh, for five dollars from Stupid Whore Energy, uh, she says, uh, and you know, I you can wonder, you can really, it's a head scratcher who this is for. Uh, <laughs> I think it's for you, Ron. She's coming at you. Ah, uh, yeah, Ron, you better look out. Uh, she says mutation rate outside the D loop is constant over many generations and yields consistent accurate results of 150,000 to 200,000 years for mitochondrial Eve. Uh, good, uh, good question. What's funny about SWE is in one debate I, we had with uh, Team Skeptic, uh, her and I must have had a full debate on chromosome two fusion just through Super Chat. So <laughs> it makes it a lot of fun. Um, yeah, when it comes to the D loop region, there are. Uh, different sets of, of mitochondrial DNA mutation rate studies. From my understanding, there's, there's two main sets. The first set looks at the D loop, which is the coding region. That we know is germline. Um, you know, I've had discussions with like Dr. Dan Stern, Cardi now, Herman Mays, they'll point out that the D loop region is highly variable. But here's the thing with that rate that we got, it's a fast rate using the empirical rate takes us back to 6,000 to 6,500 years ago. But the second set, this is what's most important. The second set that actually looks at the entire mitochondrial genome, we know that Dr. Jensen has looked at both sets and, and the data, and they have corroborated the D-loop results. But not only that, now we've taken this rate, and somebody like Jensen is so... Um, He's so confident with the rate that he's made future testable predictions on millions of other species. He's made predictions on people groups in Africa where we don't know their mutation rates. So it comes down to the testable predictions that, that flow from it. So uh, another good question, Ron, you can, you can have a word on it if you'd like. Again, uh, I, I've never heard of a D loop before just now, but I did happen to just look up uh, the similarity between human and uh, chimp DNA and, and found an article that says that we are 90, we share 98.8% of our DNA with chimps, just for the record. Um, I'll, I'll just clarify real quick. So the paper that I was talking about though had to do with the Y chromosome. So the Y chromosome being non-recombining DNA, and even though it does mutate a little faster, it, shil it still should be the most similar to humans if uh, chimps, as you correctly stated, are our closest ancestor because it's the most it's the most stable when it but comes to the actual, closest ancestor. It's their closest cousin. That's why. That's right. Important right, yeah. difference. Very important right. distinction. 
Humans and chimps share a common ancestor. You know, we didn't come from chimps. Chimps didn't come from humans. That's right. (laughs) Chimpanzees would be on on that phylogenetic tree. When it comes to nested hierarchies, we share more in terms of anatomy, morphology, physiology with the chimp than we would with the fish. Um, That's that's right. One real comment when it comes to the um, genetic similarities, the overall genetic similarities, um, you can look at that because they've tried to deal with some difficult questions. You can even find this in the main paper that derived that number, but they've tried to figure out um, some of these large mismatch sections, which actually is over 1 billion letters. So yeah, you might be able to get the 98% similarity if you ignore huge chunks of the genomes. Cause I think they're only comparing roughly like 2.2 billion letters of our actual total letters because there's chunks, there's, uh, you know, differences when it comes to uh, mismatch sequences and so on and so forth. But that, that can be a whole debate for another time. Absolutely. Okay. So from logical, plausible, probable, open mic after show, look out for the link. Um, and then he super chats and that was for $2 and then he super chats again for $5 and, uh, LPP and I, we certainly have our differences, but I agree wholeheartedly with this. Can everyone give a congratulations to James for hitting, uh, 30,000 subscribers well-deserved and thank you for being such a great community. So I love MDD. Let's, you know, <laughs> in your respective mm-hmm. homes, a round of applause, good vibes, whatever, uh, to James. So it's, what a great, what a great channel he's built. Amen. Congratulations, James. We love your channel and we hope it keeps growing and it is keep, it's going to keep growing. So you got a lot of support. Congratulations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, kudos okay. from you too. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, please. I'm, I mean, I'm speaking for James here. Uh, he would probably say it like really enthusiastically, like we love having debaters on. It's just debaters. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you, Ron, you're a really cool guy and you're oh, a lot yeah. of fun to, to talk. Oh, thanks. With. Absolutely. Um, from Mark Reed for five Australian dollars uh, to SFT, uh, have all of your papers been peer reviewed by mainstream science? It seems as if you are cherry picking and using unreliable sources. Um, so I would say about 98% of the papers that I cited in my opening are peer reviewed from secular sources. And there are some creationist uh, technical papers as well, but those can be challenged. Those can be addressed, refuted. Um, You know, that wouldn't be an argument against the conclusions of those papers. Now, of course, kind of like we've been discussing in the Q&A section, a lot of these papers when it comes to the retro transposons, the ERVs, a lot of the functions that we're now finding in, in the genome. You know, when you look to the discussion section, yeah, a lot of the times the author, because of their evolutionary bias and, 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 um, preconceived ideas, of course, they're not going to conclude young earth creation. They'll conclude things like co-option or with the orphan genes, they'll conclude de novo gene synthesis. So I'm not saying that their conclusion agrees with me, but the thing is, the question is, is de novo gene synthesis is co-option, for example, are these valid conclusions? You know, we need to discuss the data is, is the most important. And there needs to be critical thinking skills from both sides is, is what's important. Roger that. Ron, if you want to add, feel free, by the way, to add it. I know I realize a lot. Yeah. Of- no, I, I, I really do want to respond to that, particularly since he, he brought up evolutionary, uh, I forget the word he used, but it was uh, a word that implied that we're locked into an assumption of, of evolution. Uh, biases. Um, was that who you used after the Evolutionary bias. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Evolutionary bias. Uh, why do have a biblical bias? And your bias is much stronger than ours. Um, you start with the assumption that the Bible is inerrant, and then you backfit the data uh, in order to fit that assumption. Um, it's true that there is a fairly strong bias towards evolution, but it's only because evolution has now become so firmly established with such a huge amount of evidence to support it. Um, it's still possible that despite all of the vetting that it has gone through, that it's wrong. It's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. Like I said, it would be a scientific revolution on a par with, if not greater than eclipsing the two major scientific revolutions that have already happened in the 400 year history of science. And so, yes, there is a bias towards this, but not because 
because of any religious belief and not because of any prejudice, but because the current state of things is a result of literally centuries of painstaking work and attempts to refute it, unsuccessful attempts to refute it. I guess my final word on that, because I'm guessing it was my question, would be we do have starting points. We all have, you know, biases. We've got assumptions. Here's the thing, though. Like I've said multiple times today, my starting point being, uh, you know, Genesis, the account in Genesis on human origins. We are now taking that and those claims and we're testing them to modern scientific data. So, for example, the papers, the conclusions that I've shown regarding the DNA barcoding study, the um, pedigree-based mutation rate studies, the data when it comes to the Y chromosome, the orphan genes, the taxonomically restricted genes, DNA function, and I can go on and on and on. These didn't have to all corroborate and be consistent with uh, a literal interpretation of, say, Genesis, for example, like the, the data could have come back and turned out to be contradictory. So, yeah, we all have a starting point. But when you make testable predictions, you are now putting those predictions on the line. And if they come back false, well, then that's obviously going to tell us something. But the only question I would have then is if there's such a big problem with, you know, these starting points based on the Bible, why are these predictions? Why are these research programs? Why are they working so well. All right, sweet. Um, gonna try to keep things, you know, rather to, to quote James, uh, short and pithy. Just yeah, so let's go quick now. You're right. So we don't we got after shows to get to. <laughs> I know, so we don't take. And up. I have to go make dinner. Oh. I'm getting uh, clearly, road getting dry. <laughs> one has more place, better places to be than us standing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, especially so, if it's uh, dinner. I agree. Oh yeah, that's pr big time priority. Um, so from Brandon Ardeline for $5, evolution 101 for creationists, sometimes nature accidentally gives you advantageous traits. Then you get laid. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, or I guess standing, that would be more of a you uh, com are given an opportunity to comment on that uh, if you so desire. Well, a lot of the beneficials you get, a lot of the mutations that you get that turn out to be advantageous are typically due to the breaking down of pre-existing functional information, pre-existing systems breaking down, for example. We see this clearly in the Lenski experiment. You know, Lenski's bacterial populations are shrinking in functional genome size. That's why it definitely comes down to, and I'd recommend it, uh, Dr. Garrett uh, debated uh, Paul Price on genetic entropy and the definition of fitness on my channel. Paul Price is a speaker at at CMI. That was a really good debate because oftentimes, yeah, there's an increase in fitness, for example, in a narrow sense. But if we define fitness as total functionality, well, Lenski's bacteria, for example, prime example, you know, shrinking functional back um, genome sizes. Sure, there's been some nice uh, benefits to be had, but it's all due to the degradation of pre-existing functional information. So uh, go ahead. You can have the last word on that. Uh, Dr. Garrett, I know you like the topic, so go ahead. I, I do. If you're going to criticize a theory, you have to criticize what the theory actually claims. And the theory of evolution only has one kind of fitness, and that is reproductive fitness for genes relative to their environments. That is the only thing that evolution optimizes for. And all of this talk about absolute fitness and, uh, uh, and, and this idea that we are degrading or that there is some kind of beneficial and deleteriousness uh, uh, metric that you can measure independent of any uh, contextual considerations, um, none of that is part of the theory. It's all been invented by uh, creationists and it renders all of their arguments vacuous. <laughs> at least in with regards to the genetic entropy. All right. So SFT, you gave him the last word. So moving right along um, from Sunflower for $5 for Ron. Ron, you got a question. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I went in the lottery. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, they, uh, Sunflower says, can you explain the mechanism that causes some of the totipotent stem cells to become embryonic and some to become placental? No. Why do people keep asking me questions about that's a, biology? That's a pretty direct technical question. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Ron, I'm with you on that one. I don't know why that's a tough Ask me guy. about Chayton's theory. That's pretty direct. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of technical there are a lot of technical weeds that, that I could get into, but not in biology. It's like you know what, Ron, that that uh 
I, I'm just the messenger. Try not to take it out of me. <laughs> the world is chock full of biologists. Go, go ask them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well, oh. next debate we'll do just on genetic entropy oh we'll be on that today too but don't tempt ron <laughs> don't don't tempt you <laughs> god, true true listen hey my lips are sealed i am here true. to be an Good unbiased point. moderator and i am i'm determined to uh to fulfill that <laughs> duty um you did a great job hey i i try man from from the quiet gorilla uh for 10 million dollars uh, he says, okay, as you wish at Gutsick Gibbon. So that was actually directed to me because I was like, everyone send in your super chats now. Um, and the quiet girl and I are our buds. So thank you. <laughs> Very adamant. Get it. Yeah. Um, and then I put two more. They're not in the email. They're actually in the direct chat. So let me just mosey on over there. Um, from, actually, I think we, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, here we go. Three more, actually. Um, from Jay Shy for five dollars to standing for truth. Where do you draw the line personally, at genus or family, and how do you know where to draw the line? I find this very troubling in phylogeny. Well, it's tough to say because a lot of the when it comes to uh, classification can um, classification systematics, for example, a lot of it can be arbitrary. So I think I've said it before, it's going to come down to what's uh, resulting in the best testable prediction. So if we say it's the family level, we say it's the genus level. Well, if testable predictions are not flowing from, say, the family level or the genus or the species, well, then we're going to have to go back to the drawing board, you know, and, and science is a self-correcting process. So I would say for the most part, it is the family level, but when it comes to like plants and insects and, you know, this is, it's, it's not always the case. It, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. But as I've said, the two best methods in determining what's related and what's not and where those boundaries are, um, are uh, molecular clocks and uh, DNA functions. So there's a lot of testable predictions we're still awaiting uh, results for. All right, Roger that. Um, I, Ron, you can comment on that. And in the same breath, you have a question. You're just two, you're a twofer for tonight, which is just, I'm very happy. <laughs> um, from, from Mitchell for $5, Q for Ron. If the earth were proven to be less than 10,000 years old, would you become a creationist? Uh, no. Uh, well, not necessarily, because the question, I mean, that would, that would certainly rock my world, but it depends on what the evidence was, because it's possible that the Earth could be uh, that young and there could be some naturalistic explanation for it. Um, I can't offhand imagine what that would be. Uh, but... Um, and, and, and I also point out that being a creationist is not the same thing as being a young earth creationist. So the question of being a creationist or not is one question. The question of believing in a young earth or not is a different question. They're not entirely unrelated, but they are separate. Hmm. All right, Roger that. Um, or uh, Ron, you, you just, you're just like reeling them in tonight from L Mr. Popular. I know, from, but LPP is coming out for $5 taking a swing, Ron. And this is with regard to your, the, the papers that he owes you, uh, Ron, it's an open folder with tons of papers. Go read. I'm not your secretary. Last time I checked, you're semi-retired. Use that time to learn. <laughs> Fighting words, Ron. Lighting a fire under you, Ron. What do you have to say? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't recall him ever sending me an open folder, but uh, you know it's possible that I that he sent it and I missed it. So I, if I that's the that... case, that, then then I then I apologize and I will go take another look. But but I believe that the deal was not that he would just throw a bunch of papers at me, but that he would pick the three that he considered the most compelling, and I would read those three, and then we would reconvene and have another debate on those specific papers. And I'm pretty sure that he hasn't done that. <laughs> All right, that's that's a call out back at LPP. We'll see if he super chats again. <laughs> um, and and as the last super chat that we have uh, from Jay Shy for three bucks to SFP, uh, when are you going to debate Cygart? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we were in talks three months ago, and uh, he was really busy at the time, which is understandable. And he actually said mm -hmm. to reconvene in, in a few months. So <laughs> now that we're coming into September, it could be any time. I'm, I like Cygart. 
Uh, he's, he's very cordial to, to have discussions and debates with. So if, if we can set it up, I'd be happy to do so. Absolutely. And that concludes the super chats, you guys. We made it through. Um, it's more of a sigh of relief on my it. end. It's <laughs> a lot that, of work, Erica. Oh, I know. I'm just I'm slaving over here. And it's very <laughs> difficult for me to uh, to sit back and listen to a, a, a very engaging debate. Um, well, you, you, you've earned your paycheck today. Oh, I know. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why they pay me and praise the big money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more of these debates and you guys can retire. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, last, I guess, last call, um, to thank the debaters profusely for being here. I know I, I speak for James and for all the moderators on the channel. When I say, you know, the, the, the channel wouldn't be the same if it weren't for the debaters. Um, and L, again, LPP is hosting an after show, uh, on his channel. I am hosting one as well on mine. Um, and of course, Everyone is invited to go in and view after shows. That's always uh, encouraged. James likes to say, if you have an after show that you want to uh, to propose, stick it in the live chat. I'm happy as the guest mod to always uh, encourage more discussion after after these kinds of chats. Um, do you guys have anything else you want to say before I, I sign off for us here? Um, I'll start. No, I just want to thank um, Erica. Great job moderating. Um, Ron, as always, a pleasure. Um, you know, I've had you on numerous times. This isn't our first encounter, so it was a good discussion, good back and forth. You're a lot of fun to talk to. And, of course, thanks to the audience on, on Modern Day Debate. I hope everybody had fun. hope they found it was an engaging discussion. And, yeah, thanks so much. I, I always love being here. And praise, thanks for, uh, you know, being the behind-the-scenes guy. We love you, and we appreciate you. We do. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Thanks, Standing. Um... Uh, likewise, I really enjoy uh, uh, interacting with you. I'm find, happy to uh, finally get a chance to uh, to talk to you directly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. You're used to me uh, moderating you That's and right. being neutral like Erica. So, uh, <laughs> standing to argue you with me might have been surprising. So, one, one, of, one of these days, Erica, you and I need to tag team standing <laughs> and uh, LPP. Oh, Ron, oh could you imagine? That, you that would break the internet. <laughs> I would love it. I would be a huge fan and, and more than happy to do you so. You are fake news. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. Grace, I'm, I'm telling James that that soundboard needs to be confiscated from you. Those, yeah, those yeah. Well, Grace, you're having way too much fun with your Christmas. I almost got that and I can't both times. Um, I did want to see the, the uh, Jimmy Peterson. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all okay. right. I gotta go make fajitas. Yeah, get out. What, what is, I'm coming you, over for dinner, Ron. <laughs> Give me your address. <laughs> keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Um, thank you very much for for showing up. I think that's it. Pray sign us off. I'm I'm not in control.